Now a story making headlines around the world. Is this child a child or a grown woman? A bizarre story unlike any other. Is this an evil orphan or a little girl left all alone? She was an adult. You can just tell. I'm like, whoa. On top of that, the child's adoptive father tells our Stephen Fabian she threatened to kill his family. She attempted to kill Christine twice. You are an evil psychopath demon child that's come over here to murder everybody. It's a story that some have called a real life version of the horror film Orphan. Did you want to hurt them? It's all gonna come to light. Bye bye. Did you know the difference between the truth and a lie? I didn't at the time, no. What is it? Why? She's evil. Maybe there's more than one villain in this story. My mom is definitely not 100% innocent. Natalia, you still need to be on your wall. Be very good if you just quit talking or in deep, deep trouble. Oh, still my microphone on. Smile. A little less, because it, it can come off as weird or creepy. He's not the kind of guy that could do well if he had to go to prison. <laughs> this will never stop. She was just a child. Or was she? A six or seven year old child living in an apartment alone for a year? That's just not believable to me. Are you a 33 year old scam artist? No. It, it doesn't smell right. There's something wrong. Oh, it smells like shit. Today I want to talk about the Natalia Grace case. This couple was charged with neglecting their daughter who had a severe disability, uh, like a rare form of dwarfism. They came out and said, actually, no, she's not a child. She's an adult. She's a con artist. She's a sociopath and she's trying to kill us. The father is unhinged. You got a seatbelt? <laughs> This case was super popular a few years ago, I remember, and it wasn't really established what actually was the truth. And then recently there's been a docu-series on ID called The Curious Case of Natalia Grace, and it's bringing everything all back up again. And then the prosecutor came out and said, Natalia was a child. The Indiana State Police sent two detectives and we sent one of our deputy prosecuting attorneys to Ukraine. The information they released includes everything from her birth certificate, medical records, adoption documents. All of this information highlights that Natalia's actual birthday September 4th, 2003. And then as if like that wasn't enough, now people are disputing that. I have watched so many videos on this case. Frankly, my head was spinning. And the comments are so divided. Like certain videos, all the comments are like, how could they do this to her? They're awful. And then another video, it'll be like, whoa, like something's not right with her. Like, whoa, she's creepy. I wanna do what I usually do on my channel, which is I wanna give you guys the facts. Okay, then we'll discuss the theories. I'm wearing this the whole time because the, the case calls for this. And then you can decide for yourself. There was one family in New Hampshire and they gave up Natalia, they claim that there was an incident that happened that was disturbing. And where did you first live? I was in New Hampshire. Why did you leave there? I think it happened because they had two boys and one of the boys, me and him were really close. So we like, like wrestled almost. But I landed on his arm wrong. So the mom thought I was trying to break his arm. He was like, I can't do this anymore. After this family in New Hampshire decided that they, they were basically going to give up Natalia, there was another family that came in before the Barnett family. And this family, they were interviewed for this documentary and they say that um, she was evil. They could sense the evil. So I'll read you the quote. It says, this is from the father, Dwayne Ferris. He said, I can feel evil when I come into a room. I couldn't really put my finger on whether it was the situation that was evil or Natalia, but there was something wrong with her. And I think that's the first time I've ever completely trusted that intuition. Right then is when I made the decision that this was not going to happen as hard as it was to make that decision. 
So the whole thing started in 2010. Christine and Michael Barnett were planning to adopt a little girl from Haiti. Uh, except a very large earthquake struck Haiti in 2010 in January, and we weren't able to complete our adoption for the girl that we had been connected with. So when that didn't work out, Michael says that he got this cold call which is very uncommon, from uh, an adoption agency in Florida. Uh, they had reached out to us and they said, hey, we've got the perfect child for you. We've researched you. We know all about you. We think you should adopt this girl, Natalia. But obviously looking back, you shouldn't be getting cold called. You, they simply said, hey, it's a closed adoption. We're not gonna give you any information about the child. We're not gonna give you any information about the former family. Here's two pictures. Here's a Ukrainian language birth certificate. Um, and here is one doctor visit from two years before. You have 24 hours to tell us whether or not you want to adopt her. If you don't adopt her within 24 hours, we're sending her directly to foster care. They tell the Barnetts that she's six years old and that she has a severe form of dwarfism. He and his entire family, his wife and his three biological sons, they go to Florida to meet Natalia and he says like from that first meeting it was weird. We were sitting in a little uh, itty bitty office room in a strip mall and Natalia comes running in smiling ear to ear saying mommy daddy mommy daddy mommy daddy. She was just given up for adoption by her old family five minutes before that. Uh, we should have recognized that there's no six-year-old on the planet that would be happy in this situation. We went and signed paperwork and the next thing you know Natalia was ours. They're in Florida and so the next day they're like let's go to Disney World with the kids and it was that night when Michael says that while his wife Christine was bathing Natalia, he heard a blood-curdling scream. And she just says, look. I was putting her into the bathtub and I noticed that she had full pubic hair. The next thing that happens is according to Christine, where she says she found evidence of Natalia menstruating. I noticed clothing in her closet that contained at least some remnants of a menstrual cycle. But then later on, Natalia speaks out about it and she has a different story of how it went down. So she had you use a tampon one yes. time? And there was spottage, I guess, I don't know why. And she's like, see, that's blood. And that's probably... Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. She's been with us for almost seven years. To this day, she does not have a menstrual. Not one. The next weird thing, according to the Bartlett's, but no, that's not their name, Bartlett, it's Barnett. I'm just making shit up now. So the Barnett's, Barnett, not Bartlett, Barnett, Barn, Barn, Farm, Barn, Barnett, Barnett, basketball net. The Barnett's found this other girl in the area who had the same kind of dwarfism that Natalia had and also was the same age as Natalia. According to the other girl's mom and Michael, they both say that Natalia seemed much older than the other girl when they met. They said her physical traits were more developed and also her vocabulary was more developed. The next red flag, according to the Barnetts, was the whole Ukraine thing. They were told from the adoption agency that she was at a orphanage or some sort of group home in Ukraine from birth till she was five. Having been in the US for just one year, they say she didn't have any accent. She spoke English without an accent. And then when they had a Ukrainian friend that they took her to meet, she didn't understand anything that was being said. Furthermore, they said that she changed after this meeting. She was very upset. When the Ukrainian woman began speaking to Natalia in what was supposed to be her native language, she got very angry and very upset and began to lash out. She started urinating and defecating purposely in the car when everyone was there and smearing it all over the car windows. She would put thumbtacks face up on our stairs. So when we would walk up and downstairs, we would be stepping on thumbtacks. We would find knives under her bed. There was a 
moment when I woke up in the middle of the night and Natalia was standing over my bed uh, with a knife in her hand, very blank look on her face. She began to attempt to harm my sons in a very serious manner. As they would be crossing a street, Natalia had already found something that meant something very important to each of my boys. My youngest son, who was six, was, was into cows, so she found his favorite cow toy. My, my nine-year-old son liked cars, so she found his favorite car toys. And my 11-year-old son was attending university, so she had gotten his homework out of his backpack. As they would be crossing a very, very busy street, she would make sure that the boys were paying attention, and she would launch everything up into the air, into traffic, and they would instantly run into traffic to try to retrieve their items. Frightening. Immediately thereafter, Natalia would simply tell us very coldly and very directly, I'm trying to kill the boys. There's this really weird clip. It's like an old home video clip from this time where Natalia is sitting on a chair and she's reading the Bible and she's asked like, what are you reading? Why are you reading that? And she says, like, to stop the evil thoughts. What is it? The Bible. Why? Evil thoughts? So Natalia was asked later on about these incidents and this is her explanation for like the lemon pledge thing. She says you sprayed bleach in her coffee. It was lemon pledge for tables. And she actually has footage of you doing that. So we had missed a spot. So what I did was I scooted the chair over so I could get up there and I scooted her coffee back because it was ne it was in front of it. So I scooted it back and I grabbed it. She came out and was like, what are you doing? And then she claimed that I tried to spray it in her coffee. You could look in her coffee. There was nothing. There's different accounts to what happened, but something happened where Christine and Natalia were near an electric fence. This video is sponsored by Every Plate. Now you guys know I love Every Plate, not only because they're the most affordable meal kit, but they have really good recipes and they're so easy to make in six simple steps. They have 15 minutes or less dinners. They've got things like feta stuffed salmon salad or a one pan sweet chili turkey lettuce wrap, like very light, very healthy, very satisfying. I absolutely loved this dish. The sauce, you guys, the sauce on this, first of all, it was like roasted potatoes, sauteed zucchini, really well spiced chicken, which is amazing and fabulous. But the sauce for me was everything. They have this like chicken concentrate with the garlic, and the green onion, and then you put the sour cream and the Dijon mustard and a little bit of butter and you let the whole thing melt. Oh my God, it was so good. So if you're interested, okay, you can get a dollar and 49 cents per meal if you use my code. Okay, go to everyplate.com, enter the code NOOR49 and you can get a dollar and 49 cents per meal. Thank you so much to Every Plate for sponsoring this video. And back to the video. Somehow, someway, Christine falls near the fence, and some versions say that it was an accident, and other versions say that Natalia pushed her into the electric fence. You said you tried to push her into an electric fence. It was like a trail on a farm. Yeah. And so I sat down because my legs hurt really bad. Christine had Michael and the boys go up ahead of us. She sat down next to me and was like, Natalia, you need to get up. So she got up and she was helping me, trying to help me get up, but I fell again and she fell with me. And the electric fence wasn't that far from us. The electric fence incident was a turning point because after that happened, 911 was called and Natalia ends up being put into a mental hospital. The employees of this mental hospital, they spoke off the record because they're, they're not allowed to talk about this, but they said that Natalia was quote mature for what her age was supposed to be and that she uh, was behaving in disturbing ways, what they quote called sexually aggressive. They say she was propositioning the male patients and it ends up being this issue. According to Michael, he said the doctor told him like there was a therapist that was talking to Natalia and told Michael, she said like she's trying to kill you and how she's gonna do it and how she's gonna bury the bodies. And we think she is a sociopath. A lot of these things that I'm telling you, I'm saying Michael said, Michael said, because he was really 
really out there. Just says blatantly, plainly, no emotion. I'm trying to kill you. I promise you within five years, someone's dead. Christine, on the other hand, she did like an interview in the beginning. She was talking about she was gonna kill family members. But after that, she was much more quiet. She didn't participate in this docu-series. Her and Michael are divorced, and Michael is also saying that not only is Natalia uh, this bad person, but Christine is as well. It's very good if you just quit talking or it. He talks about how Christine would make Natalia stand for a long time against the wall until she um, soiled herself. Natalia, you still need to be on your wall. She made Natalia sleep outside on the deck and that like social services were called because of that. He said that Christine did that to all of them. It wasn't just Natalia. It was him. It was his son and his son Jacob, he, the whole thing is so weird because he gets caught on this like hot mic moment where they seem to be like hiding something or coming up with a story. And then he realizes like his mic is on and freaks out. While kicking down the stairs, we said we're not going to say, right? Oh, still my microphone on. So back to the timeline, right? The fence incident happens. Natalia goes to the mental hospital and now she's released from the mental hospital. This is when her parents do the notorious age change, where they legally change her age. While I was at the hospital, they signed paperwork and got me re-aged. So- Can you tell me about that? I don't even know what to say about it yeah. because I don't know what happened. So basically she went from eight years old to 22 years old in one day. And this becomes like such a huge issue in the case because her birth certificate from Ukraine says that she was born September 4th, 2003, which means that when they adopted her in spring, I think, of 2010, she was six years old. So in 2010, when she was supposed to be six, they take her to a physician and the physician estimates that she's actually eight, not six. And it's difficult actually to determine because she has this disability and they're going by the bones and all these other things, but it's complicated because of what she's going through. So they can't tell if it's stunted because of her disability. So she could potentially be older. So it's very like, it's all estimated, right? So it seems like they're estimating her at least a couple years older when they compare it to other people with the same disability. They do it again in 2012 at that mental hospital and they determine that she's not eight, she's 11 approximately so now that same year in 2012 the barnett's they go to a doctor and they are trying to get her age legally changed and the doctor determines that <laughs> she's 22. the doctor said that when you're an adult or 18 years old your bones stop growing and he determined that her bones did not grow for the past four years. So she must have been 18 four years ago, which means that she's now 22. So they go, they have a judge approve it and everything, and they end up changing her birth date officially from September 4th, 2003 to September 4th, 1989, which means now she's 22, she's an adult. A year after this age change, the eldest son, he actually has Asperger's, but he's like this child prodigy. Like he had had TED talks and he was on 60 Minutes and he was on the news. Like One son, Jake, is a math genius who was profiled on 60 Minutes in 2012. He ends up at the age of 14 getting accepted to this really prestigious university in Canada. And this is when the Barnetts take Natalia put her in an apartment, which they pay for. I just know that I had got out of the hospital and she got me an apartment. Christine and her go out the next day and they find her an apartment in Westfield. Westfield, Indiana is in Hamilton County, Indiana. Hamilton County, Indiana is the, the richest part of the state. A single floor apartment complex. She's got a living room. She's got a, a dining room. She's got a little eating kitchen. She's got a bathroom and she's got a bedroom and basically leave her alone there and go to Canada 
with their kids. Now, the interesting thing here is when Michael talks about it. After a year of living on her own, uh, that's when my son got an offer to attend university in Canada. He was at the time 14 years old, going on 15. There was no way he was going to be able to do that on his own. It's no big deal to leave Natalia alone in the apartment because she's an adult. But there's also another factor here, which is, yes, he has Asperger's, but he's a prodigy and he doesn't seem to have any physical disabilities. Whereas Natalia has a very obvious, severe physical disability and the apartment isn't even equipped for someone with this disability. She was going to the grocery store. She was hanging up things in her apartment. She was capable of living on her own. When she was discharged from hospital the final time in 2012, she had stated in her discharge papers she did not wish to have contact with us at all anymore. They get her food stamps. She's enrolled in like an adult um, education thing, which is a couple blocks away that she walks to. And so it seems that she's fine-ish. When Natalia's introducing herself to people, she's telling them she's 22. But later on, Natalia is gonna say that she only said she was 22 because her parents told her that she was 22, but really she was eight. She was living alone in an apartment for a year and then in another apartment for a couple months while she was eight, is what she says now. A lot of the neighbors have been interviewed and stuff and it's interesting because you get two perspectives here some of the neighbors feel bad for her and that she's a victim and like how could they do this to her they just literally left her to the wolves and then other neighbors are like oh my god she some like something's not right she said i pulled a knife on my parents big deal it's like a serial killer or something so casually they put attempted murder into a conversation the ones that felt bad for her they said it was clear that she was severely disabled and struggling. Like there, she was on the first floor in the apartment complex, but there were some steps that she had to climb to, to get to like the, the front door of the building. And they said she seemed to struggle with those steps. They said like the countertops, everything was too high. The washer and dryer was not within reach for her. And so they noticed that you know, her clothes were dirty. Natalia Barnett's neighbors said she was smelly, unkempt, and rarely checked on. And because she couldn't really cook for herself and reach the stove and do all that, and she had the food stamps, she basically lived off like ramen noodles, packaged foods, like pizza, like that kind of stuff. But then there were the other neighbors, the ones that complained. And they said that she was creepy and inappropriate. So the first thing they said was that she made inappropriate um, sexual like remarks and behaviors towards people, including children. And you know, other people are interpreting it like, well, maybe this is, maybe something happened to her and she's acting out because she, you know, like this is how she's responding to, to the trauma, right? But other people are like, no, this is wrong, we're upset. But then neighbors who said, that she told them very casually that she tried to kill her family. The Barnetts, the ones who said she tried to kill us. At one point, Natalia even calls 911 on herself when she's at this apartment and she tells them like, I, I, I help, like I'm stalking someone. I, I'm, I don't wanna hurt anybody. I think I'm gonna hurt someone. So due to all these complaints and stuff, uh, Natalia ends up getting evicted from this first apartment the Barnetts put her in and then the Barnetts take her and they put her in another apartment in another area which people say that Christine said it was a quote white trash area and it would be better there because like people wouldn't complain as much. A detective testified today that her mother saw the city as a white trash town where nobody would notice. At this second apartment, this is where everything changes because there's a neighbor who hears about Natalia from another neighbor and goes to see Natalia and basically takes pity on her. And I go, are you 22? She said, yeah. She said, I have my own apartment. And I'm like, no, you don't. So she took me over to her house, and it was definitely her apartment. She had a bed in there. She had a TV. She had, like, some boxed food in her freezer. So she came to our house and hung out down there, and she never left. And basically, ever since then, Natalia's been with this family. But what ends up happening as a result of this is the authorities get involved. 
uh, social services gets involved with, with the new family and Natalia's she's not paying bills at this second apartment. So like the phone and the electricity gets cut off and eventually police find out about her case and you know she tells them that they left me here basically. So because she was legally 22, when police found out about it, they couldn't charge her parents, the Barnetts, with neglecting a child. But because she had this severe disability, they could charge them with neglecting a dependent. And that's what they did. This is when the circus begins. Because Michael and Christine, they post bail. They, they're both like gonna plead not guilty. And while they're awaiting trial, they're going on a bunch of media outlets and giving their side of the story. She was talking about she was going to kill family members. She put chemicals on the coffee. I mean, this is this is uh, horrifying. Fact is, Natalia, not once, not twice, but three times in American court, has been educated and ruled to be a fully grown adult. Natalia was represented by two attorneys, and they never challenged the decision. She then got her own apartment nearby where we lived, about five minutes away. It's within two blocks of a bus stop. She lived there for a year on her own while we lived by her. We visited her about twice a week. Uh, we hired a traveling nurse. In a twist here, uh, you could end up going to prison. Uh, I don't believe that's gonna happen. This is when Natalia, with her new family, they all go on Dr. Phil and they do an interview. Talia speaks out for the very first time, along with Cynthia and Antoine Manns, the family who has taken her in. There's been a lot of controversy, obviously, about your age because yeah. of how old are you? I'm 16. What exactly is your disorder? I have dwarfism. Um, it's called diastrophic dysplasia. Did you ever want to stab them? No. Did you ever make plans to stab them? No. If I ever went in the room, it was to wake them up because I was either scared of a nightmare or something like that. But I never went in their room. I didn't. There's no way she could take care of herself. I was like, I can't just leave her there. How old were you at that time? I was eight years old. At eight years old, you're living alone in an apartment. Yes. And you stayed in that first apartment for a year at eight years old. Yes. A six or seven year old child living in an apartment alone for a year. That's just not believable to me. She would get into trouble just like any normal child would. She's amazing. When we got her, the first thing she said, we got a call from Christine. Oh, yeah. And she said, take her to a, a psychiatric facility and get her evaluated because she's crazy and don't believe a word she has to say. Another thing is when I was living in my first apartment, she actually had me call the police on myself. Like, she told me to call them and tell them that I wanted to hurt others and I wanted to hurt myself. They put me in handcuffs. And they took me to one of the psychiatric hospitals, and I was out that same night. They said that I wasn't crazy, like she's saying and all that. Are you a 33-year-old scam artist? No. No. <laughs> no, I promise you I'm not. And so then you go to Michigan and they do test, correct? Mm -hmm. And they came back and concluded that she was how old? 14. 14 years old. You are an evil psychopath demon child that's come over here to murder everybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my. Yeah. You're right. This movie, The Orphan, this Russian woman right next door to Ukraine, 30 years old, pretends to be a teen, gets adopted by a family, comes in, terrorizes them. And here we've got this individual from the Ukraine that has been said to be as much as 33, comes in, terrorizes his family. And if Christina made all of this up, she wasn't very creative. She tore it from this movie. I was just going to say that because the orphan came out one year before they did this to yeah. her. You're 16, but legally, how old are you? 30. I don't even feel 30. You come across as much more mature than a 16-year-old. I felt like I was already robbed of my childhood, mm -hmm. but when I got re-aged, that's when it really hit hard. The Barnetts, they're being criminally prosecuted, they've been charged at least. What do you think should happen to them? 
I want them to be able to have their normal lives back after this is all over and they did their time. So you think they should go to jail? The media tracked down Natalia's birth mother from Ukraine and they do like a DNA test to prove that that is her birth mother. And they ask her like, how old is she? When did you give birth to everything? And she says this exact same story that the adoption agency told the Barnetts that she was born September 4th, 2003. She says that the doctors told her that, you know, you're not gonna be able to take care of her because she has a very severe disability. And in America, like they can take care of her, like it's better off if you give her away and the mom's really sad. And she feels like, you know, she wishes she never gave Natalia away. So at this time now, Michael is preparing for his trial because he's gonna plead not guilty. I know he's not the kind of guy that could do well if he had to go to prison. Here's the deal. We can't use the word adult. I don't know why. We can't use the word child. Can't, but we don't want to use the word child. What is Natalia to you? She is my daughter. She's legally my adopted daughter. Your 21 year old daughter. We're gonna say, did you abandon your 22 year old daughter, right? No. That's that's going to be the phrase. In terms of like an ideal jury, I know it's hard to predict, but what are we looking for? People that like me. Um, and that's hard. <laughs> Educated, middle-class jurors. Facial expression and demeanor? Smile. A little less. There you go. Mm -hmm. Because it, it can come off as weird or creepy or detached. Obviously not a ha super happy smile. I'm not, no. not happy to be in court. No. Um, it's also not... <sighs> this is the f Super Bowl. You're gonna go whoop somebody's ass. I know you got this. I love you, man. Bye, fellas. All right, see you tomorrow. Bye, guys. Natalia testifies at the trial and she says, you know, they left me and they never taught me anything and I wanted to be with them. The judge did not allow Natalia's age to be an issue in the trial because she was legally an adult and they couldn't reverse it. So the issue became, did they have a legal obligation based on her dependency, which was based on her disability. Attorneys played videos of Natalia running across the street, walking through a grocery store and clinging to the edge of a swimming pool. And the jury finds Michael to be not guilty. I can breathe. I haven't been able to breathe in, in, a, in a very long time. Christine's trial was supposed to be right after Michael's, but after he was found not guilty, the prosecution dropped all the charges. Prosecutors today said in the case, there just wasn't enough evidence to make a case against the adoptive mother. So now Michael and Christine are free, no charges. Natalia is still legally uh, born in 1989. So I think she's like in her thirties now legally but the debate still remains. All we know for sure is it was September 4th. We know she's a Virgo, but we don't know how old she is. So then the prosecution, they come out and they say, because of this public outcry and like everything, we want to release this information. We respect the court's decision. We understand why he ruled that way, but we thought it would be better served if we released what that evidence was. The information they released includes everything from her birth certificate, medical records, adoption documents, all of this information highlights that Natalia's actual birthday is September 4th, 2003. Natalia was a child. A lot of people, after they heard about that, they were like, okay, well, I guess she is the age that she claims she is. The skeptics, right, the conspiracy theorists, they're like, listen, people can forge these things. And in certain countries, it's, it's easier than others, especially when they're trying to get children adopted because it's, it's well known that the younger the child is, the more likely they are to get adopted. And this is for a child with no disabilities. Factor in disabilities, and it makes it even more difficult for the child to get adopted. So was there an incentive from people who cared about her and wanted her to get adopted to make her seem younger? Some people think yes. So what is the current situation now? The current situation is that Natalia, they say she's still with that family. Natalia ended up with yet another family. Praise the Lord, everybody. Michael and Christine are divorced and they're free. They had their docu-series and there's another one coming up this summer. It's called Natalia Speaks. It's like part of that docu-series and it's all Natalia's point of view. She was trying to make me seem like 
I was just this big, crazy person. That's not true. This is my story, and I'm only gonna say it once. And then I heard that there's like a Hulu series that's coming out where they're gonna like reenact like a like a scripted series about this case it, it, it's just taking on a life of its own so those are the facts now okay let's discuss the theories hear me out because this is ooh. okay the theories are basically this okay either this family wanted to get rid of Natalia. Maybe they wanted to go to Canada for the other son and they didn't want to have to deal with taking her there. Maybe she was going to start to need a lot more uh, expensive health care and they didn't want to pay for it. This is the conclusion I came to. Natalia needs surgeries. And I think because they have Jacob, he's autistic and they wanted to do the college. So I think Christine felt like it was a burden. You're not a burden to me. And so they came up with this solution to say she's older and we're not responsible for her anymore and we'll, we'll just get rid of her. The other theory is that maybe the agency and whoever, they lied about her age to get her adopted, that the age thing is a bit maybe untrue. And then the other thing people talk about is what about the associate? What about her trying to kill them? Like, what's the deal with that? And the thing with that is, although she completely denies it, and the Barnetts are so gung ho that this happened, the neighbors, to me, the neighbors seem to be like, like, what would they have to gain from saying that? And the thing is, there were some people that say good things, some people that don't but maybe it was just because some people saw that side of her and some people didn't. And the ones who did, they said the same thing that the Barnetts were saying. And then it turns out that she had this sort of history with the other family where even that family, the mom felt like she was trying to hurt her son. So I, I don't know if there's a pattern there. Then I think about when she went on Dr. Phil with the new family and they said she hasn't done anything. She didn't display any kind of psychotic behavior. We've had three kids since she's been with us. She's been there for the delivery of one literally in the delivery room when her brother was born. She's been seven years for these people. No drama, no, no problems. <laughs> It could be just that maybe this family was what she needed. You're not a burden to me. This unconditional love. Maybe she felt disposable, right? All these families from one to the other, one to the other. And when she feels threatened, she's acting out. And there's finally a family that maybe she does act out here and there, but they're not going to give up on her. And maybe eventually with all that, she sort of stopped expressing those behaviors. Even if she did do those things, you know, then comes the whole thing, well, is she really to blame? Like, is it mental illness? Is it trauma? Like, she's got all these horrible things going on in her life. Who knows what she went through before she got there? The, the, the inappropriate sexual stuff. That's probably a sign that somebody did something to her inappropriately. If it was a scam, what was the point of the scam? Just to get someone to adopt her? And the thing that makes it hard to know who to believe is the fact that the Barnetts are kind of unhinged. And so I don't find them very credible. And then with Natalia, it's like, I want to believe her, but given what she's been through, it's, it's hard to ignore other people's testimony that aren't the Barnetts that corroborate this, like the doctors, the neighbors, things like that. It's hard to ignore. And given her situation, is it really that hard to believe that she would be acting out given what she's been through? No. You know, I feel like the truth is somewhere in the middle in all of these things because they're both so extreme. It's like, she's a 22 year old evil dwarf killer sociopath. And then here it's like, I'm an eight year old innocent. I never did anything wrong in my life. It's, it's probably somewhere around here. And that's what I think to me, to me, my opinion, my conspiracy, allegedly don't sue me. I think she's not as old as they say she is, but she's also not as young as she says she is. Okay. Hear me out. I feel like it's somewhere in the middle. They needed her to be an adult so that they could legally not be uh, required to take care of her. But I do think that it's possible that she was maybe, I don't know, 13 instead of six.
Because I find it really hard to believe some of the things she was able to do and everyone saying that she didn't seem like she was an eight-year-old. But also, when you look at the older pictures and you look at her interview with Dr. Phil, clearly she's aged. She wasn't a full-grown adult when she showed up. That is no, I don't believe that at all. She clearly looks like a kid that grew. Hello and happy Thanksgiving. But with the, with the, with the disability, right, you know, she probably looks younger than someone her age would look without the disability. So it's, it's hard to determine. It's hard to determine. Or maybe she's telling the truth. I don't know. What do you guys think? What do you guys think? Let me know. I have a feeling it might be a mixed bag. I don't know. You guys tell me what you think. Um, thank you so much for watching. Uh, thank you to Every Plate for sponsoring this video, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye!